Hallelujah. And start regulating all those gifts in here. Praise Hallelujah. God. Hallelujah. The way a charismatic church is supposed to be. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, tonight I want to talk about prophets, politicians, peace, and prosperity. God, let's get them all. Hallelujah. <laughs> no, we see out there a phenomenal, well, it's really a grassroots movement that's been reported a lot in the national press. It's seen everywhere, <clears throat> non-charismatic and charismatic groups, um, an entire political religious right that has arisen in these charismatic, non-charismatic groups supporting traditional Americanism and condemning any of those like ourselves who predict any doom or gloom upon the church or upon especially their beloved country, America, the beautiful. <laughs> Supposed to be the land of the free, the home of the brave. <laughs> Try to preach the gospel out in Waconia, and you'll see how free you are. That's right. This isn't the land of the free. And it's certainly not the home of the brave. Who wants to go to war and fight against other countries on behalf of America? You get uh, stigmatized like the poor Vietnam vets whenever you get back home, and they crucify you for going and fighting for your country. And so we don't have any brave people around, and it's certainly not the land of the free. People get these nostalgic ideas and get possessed by spirits. It's almost like medieval romantic ideas about one's beloved country that you're partial to because it's got golden harvest and purple mountains and there's brotherhood from sea to sea. And this is the most segmented. We've got 50 states in the country the most segmented, divided nation on the face of the earth. That's right, brother. I mean, in other nations, you don't have 50 states in one nation. That's right. And it wasn't but just 100 years ago, half of them wanted to separate and form a whole new country, a whole new nation. And how was that prevented? Well, they went to war. All these brothers went to war, and it actually was that. You had a brother who was a Confederate and a brother who was a Union soldier fighting each other over the what? The land of the free. Well, they weren't so free to leave the country. Why, we, why didn't we just let them go? People aren't free here, and especially not in the religious realm. And that's what's getting so many religious people all upset. They're finally finding out they're not so free after all. And yet they're supporting what they think, the Constitution, what they think guarantees them their freedom. And it doesn't guarantee them anything because they're not experiencing that freedom. They don't have any freedom out there. And so it was just last week Congress defeated the proposed amendment to the Constitution to have public prayer, voluntary prayer in school. And like some of the senators, like the one from Connecticut who is and still is against it, said there's no need for an amendment. You can do that right now. You can stand up in school and pray if you want to. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing illegal with that at all. And yet these religious people are mounting these whole campaigns to get something they don't realize they've already got. Of course, they're wanting it to be sanctioned by the state. And yet they're the ones telling us now we ought to keep church and state separated. Uh, out there in Nebraska, the school out there in Nebraska, we ought to keep church and state separated. And yet they're wanting prayers to be sanctioned by the state, by the secular state. I mean, there's no such thing as a religious state. State, by definition, is secular in nature. Amen. The only religious state that ever existed was the nation of Israel, and that was in the Amen. Old Testament. Hallelujah. And it was thoroughly religious, and it was built upon theocratic principles, and there has been no nation since then, and there will be no nation to come that's going to be like Israel, that's going to fill in a New Testament sense the Old Testament shoes of Israel because that's been done away with. And they're always giving us these examples of we ought to have righteous presidents like Israel had righteous kings. And there is no comparison because now people are dealt with as individuals. They don't know 
their Old Testament, they have an improper concept of their Old Testament to think that you can compare the United States. They almost think that, you, that the United States is New Testament Israel. I mean, some right. think the church is New Testament Israel. Uh -huh. And they're not quite as bad as the ones who think that the United States is New Testament Israel, that we're going to have a Christian country. There is no such thing as a Christian country. Look over in the book of Psalms. I think it's in Psalm chapter 9 and verse 17. There is no such thing as a Christian country. <clears throat> you find throughout the New Testament, the state was always in direct conflict with the people of God. You read the book of Acts. That's what you find from the Jewish state all the way to the great state of that day, the Roman Empire. And they were always at odds with the people of God and the New Testament disciples. Right. And they didn't petition for their way. Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, honor the king. He didn't say try to become the king. Honor the king, not don't try to get the king fired. Honor the king. Don't Amen. petition the king and try to get your ways. Honor the king. Well, Psalm 9, verse 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Well, name me a nation who's not forgotten God if they ever remembered him at one time. Well, I can name you one. It's this country who's forgotten God. Oh, it says on our coins in God we trust. Then why don't we just throw away all of our missiles then? Just because someone says in God we trust, that doesn't mean anything. And that gives them uh, a nice religious air to this secular state. People talk about born-again presidents. Anyone can stand up and say they're born again. Amen. What's your definition of born again? Someone being able to say that they're born again? Well, millions of people are saying they're born again today. Amen. That doesn't mean that they're born again. Amen. But this is the whole religious political movement where these religious people, and we're going to major on the charismatic aspect of it, are condemning those of us that are saying anything like what I've been saying for the last five or ten minutes and telling us we ought to support Congress and the Senate, <clears throat> the House of Representatives, pray for the president. We should pray. The Bible teaches that. But almost try to become president ourselves and make sure we've got one who's born again. Well, we're going to look at the political side of this more in a future message because I've got probably enough messages to last us until... It's time to go, time to move on this subject, so we'll probably end up uh, our teachings here on this whole subject of these false prophets that are prophesying the political religious themes and deceptions that they are, that all you have to do is just open your eyes and you'll see what's going on out there. So rather than looking at the political side tonight, which would be very easy to get into, uh, we'll go to the material side where they're prophesying a neo-millennial charismatic utopian society for all of us, really not based on any New Testament passages or old, but based upon what they know the masses like to hear. Masses don't like to hear about judgment, war, and bloodshed. They like to hear what's pleasing to the ears. Right. And so over in Zechariah, if you'll turn to Zechariah chapter 8, need to understand that all of the Old Testament prophets, and we put ourselves in the category of, with them of believing what they prophesied, Amen. prophesied that in the future there was going to come a time of great material and political peace and prosperity. Uh, when you put the New Testament revelation with the Old, you find out from Revelation chapter 20 that it's a period known as the millennium, spoken of as a thousand-year period on four occasions, four or five occasions there in Revelation 20, which matches all of these beautiful Old Testament prophecies that are talking about this future age of political and material and social peace and well-being and security and prosperity. However, the problem is the people that are prophesying these things today, what I call the false prophets of peace and politics, are telling us that we're going to have a millennial experience of utopia before the millennium actually comes. Because they are not prophesying. You need to be aware of this. 
their prophecies, I'm going to read you one here in a moment, and I've got many of them that we'll cover in the next few weeks. Their prophecies aren't ones that are directed toward the millennium. Uh, that's what ours are directed toward. If you hear any prophecies of peace and prosperity, there are going to be no peace and prosperity while this old wicked world is here. Amen. Now, once this world is gone and we enter into that blessed age of peace and prosperity, and that is just where it'll be, and it won't be prior to that time. A uh, utopia, by the way, is a word they got from a publication by Sir Thomas More in 1516 in his book called Utopia. That is an unreal world or an unreal society. And that is exactly what charismatic false prophets of peace and politics are prophesying and predicting today that we're going to soon, if not right now, I'm going to give you an article that says it's already begun, that we've entered into a great period of peace and prosperity. And the Old Testament prophets do refer to this period, but it's a period that can only come when the Prince of Peace comes, Amen. and not prior to when he comes. And they're trying to get a jump on the millennium. That's why I call it neo-millennialism. They're trying to get a jump on the millennium and add an extra 50 years to the millennium. And they want it to start right now. Now in Zechariah 8, 22, 23, you hear them prophesying about nations and things. Well, the Bible prophesies about that, but that is for, strictly for the period of the millennium. <coughs> Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Now, if you've not stayed up with their articles, I've got them dating back to 76 and even earlier than that. If you haven't stayed up with their articles that they published or stay up with what's going on over charismatic airwaves out there today, then you might be surprised whenever you do catch up with what's going on to find out how flowery the language really is about, and I hate to use all the examples because I remember them from the material I've read and I'm going to be bringing that the next few weeks to come, but about, I just remember one prophecy said that the streets of Washington, D.C. are going to be filled with the power of God like the book of Acts was. Said they're going to be people healed and saved and baptized in the Spirit and all the lame are going to be brought to the Capitol and be healed in Washington, D.C. Now, lest some people confuse that with the biblical prophecies, like look at, look at Isaiah 8.22, what we just read. Now, that kind of sounds like a lot of what they're saying, Isaiah 8, or Zechariah 8.22. Many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem. By the way, it's Jerusalem and not Washington, <laughs> which they say is spiritual Jerusalem. Or one of them is, is even saying that the Twin Cities is, is New Jerusalem, earthly Zion, the Twin Cities, because of all the charismatic churches around. Yeah, we're getting out of here. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'll tell you, God sets us right here. He, I guess he sent us to the right place. Set us right in the midst of all this perversion and corruption. And, you know, you have to just continually labor and hammer away because you've got so much of it around. I mean, it's everywhere around where we are now. One of the big names is prophesying this is what Minnesota is all about. It's, it's spiritual Israel, and the power of God is going to be over in the Twin Cities. And I've been to those charismatic meetings over there in the yeah. Twin Cities. <laughs> and women are preaching at most of them. Yeah. I'm thinking of some churches where they are the pastors of them. Now, what are you going to do then with the word of God? When Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority. They just, you know what charismatics do. They just breeze right over that like it's not even there. There was an article I was looking at just before coming tonight. Uh, what was the title of it? Something about obeying uh, the whole word of God. And it was written by a woman evangelist. And so you think, how can a woman evangelist even write an article like that? <laughs> or have a title like that, obeying the whole word of God, telling us how we're supposed to walk in the spirit and obey the word. And that's not even a difficult passage that you had to uncover in Leviticus or something. That's right over there in 1 Timothy 2 or 1 Corinthians 14. 
Thus saith the Lord of hosts, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, not an American, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Now these are great prophecies of, of unusual spiritual events that are going to be taking place, but remember, it's not neo-millennialism, it's Revelation 20 millennialism. It'll happen when the millennium happens and not earlier. Uh, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 4 and verse 1. People are, are a little off on their timetable. They're getting about a 50-year jump on God. They want the millennium to start right now. And whether we want it to or not is really beside the point. It's not going to until the Prince of Peace comes back. Isaiah, the same book, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse uh, 6, calls him the Prince of Peace. And so we're not going to have peace until he comes. By the way, that's our subject tonight is the false prophets of peace. We'll talk about their politics in another message. And it all ties in as we're going to use the Old Testament as well as the New those who are prophesying peace generally do it for a political reason. It's not peace individually. It's peace for your whole state or your whole country or nation or a whole group of people. It was true in the Old Testament and it's true today. Isaiah 4, 1. And in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man. That's not what we need. We need chapter 2. That's about the millennium as well. Chapter 4 is. But chapter 2 is what we need. It's about the millennium as well. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now, it shall come to pass in the last days. Now, it's an ambiguous phrase, last days, and you have to interpret that in light of what the New Testament says. And the New Testament tells us when this portion of the last days will be fulfilled. And you have to get over into Revelation to find out when. Because all during the ministry of the apostles, all during the ministry of Jesus, they weren't expecting peace. Jesus said in John 15, if they've persecuted me, they'll persecute you. And if they've kept my word, they'll keep yours. He wasn't expecting peace around him. And he tells us in Matthew 10, 34, not to expect peace. He says, don't think that the Son of Man has come to bring peace. He's come to bring a sword. Amen. Amen. And they don't like that in Matthew 10, 34, and especially the next verse. <laughs> said it variants relatives. Not to talk about senators or congressmen. I mean, relatives is too much for most charismatics to handle. And he said, think not that I've come to do this. And they think that he has. That the first advent brought peace. The first advent brought peace in our heart, not peace in this world. The second advent will bring peace in the world. Again, they're getting their chronological timetable all topsy-turvy and mixed up. And this shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. Well, we haven't seen this happen. And shall be exalted above the hills. Have you seen Jerusalem just raise up several thousand feet over there? No. And all nations shall flow unto it. Well, everyone's trying to get out of that region over there today. So we know it couldn't be fulfilled yet. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. Well, many people aren't saying that today. Just a very few people are saying, Let's go to the house of the Lord. Amen. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Now that's not taking place yet. Where nation has not desired to fight against nation. Now, keep that in mind, verse 4, you might want to even keep your hand there and turn for a moment over to Matthew 24. And I want to show you two contradictory passages of Scripture if you're going to try to put them into the same year. You can't have nations not learning war anymore and at the same time nations rising up against nation and kingdoms against kingdoms. 
talking about two different times. And all you've got to do is read your newspaper to find out which one of them we're in. Amen. You don't have to be a prophecy expert. Just read your newspaper. Our nation's not learning war anymore. They're learning war just as quickly as they can. Amen. So that must mean we're not in Isaiah 2 time. It's not time to be prophesying peace and prosperity for sinful people. We must be in Matthew 24 time. We'll start with verse 4. Take heed that no man deceive you. <clears throat> verse 6, ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Then verse, not just rumors, but verse 7, it'll actually happen. Mm -hmm. Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. In verse 8, you haven't seen anything yet. He said this is all just the beginning of sorrows. <clears throat> which must mean there's a lot more out there in the future. This is just the beginning of sorrow. Amen. Amen. Now, you compare that with this. He calls his little column the news before it happens. I call it the views that never happen. <laughs> <laughs> because he's setting dates, and that's always helpful, because I can find out, Deuteronomy 13 and 18, whether he's a true or false prophet. Amen. Amen. We're told in Deuteronomy chapter 13, if he prophesies something's going to come to pass, it doesn't come to pass, then don't be afraid of that prophet because he's a false prophet. Amen. Now, this is a look at 1980. So we can judge this because this has been several years ago. This is just one, and I'll bring it back later because it's got two other subjects that we'll deal with later. Now, all right, this is the long, thus saith the Lord. Now, we're charismatic, so we believe in prophecies. 1979 has come and gone, and 1980 is to begin. Uh, let's see, by the way, this was delivered, <coughs> uh, what had to be, December the 31st, 1979. You know, it gets that time of year, and people kind of get prophetic all of a sudden. Uh, some people call it resolutions. Charismatics call them prophecies. Uh, but they're false, nonetheless. All right, Calvary, Evangeli Calvary Evangelistic Temple is where this was given by a well-known charismatic leader. Now, how would you like that? Uh, they're still back in the Old Testament. Must have a Messianic Jew for a pastor there or something. Hadn't gotten away from the word temple. That's the Old Testament. <laughs> Jesus said, Matthew 18, Matthew 16, I'm going to establish my assembly. Not my temple. That was an Old Testament term. Calvary, he's not on the cross. He's at the Father's right hand. Oh, yeah. Evangelistic oh, oh, temple. Yeah. <laughs> it's not to be a meeting at the well, your church, to try to get people of Samaria saved. It is to be a charismatic instruction and teaching center. Amen. So how do you like that for the name of a church? Calvary, evangelistic temple. Well, that's not even what I wanted to read. <laughs> what shall we expect from 1980? Now, what does Jesus tell us we're to expect according to Matthew 24? Okay, you, we just read a couple of verses. Shall it be more strife and turmoil? Shall it be more woe? Shall it be the year of the devil? No, no, no. <laughs> Yeah, that's underlined in red here. <laughs> Three no's. No, no, no. This is not going, that was not going to be the year. Now go back and look in your magazines what 1980 was about. It's the same as 1984. Strife, turmoil, woe, and the year of the devil, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> now he says this is what God's telling him by the Spirit. He's a false prophet of peace. Prophesying peace, no more strife, turmoil. That's fine if you're going to prophesy that, but tell us that this is going to be what the millennium will be like. It won't be the year of the devil. Revelation 20 says he'll be locked up in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Amen. By the way, he'll come out after that and start all over again before he's finally destroyed. But during the millennium, it won't be the year of the devil. You're not going to have strife, turmoil, and woe then. But he said 1980. He's prophesying this. Uh, you know, around that time of year, you get predictive, and especially if you're claiming to be a prophet, and a false one at that. When it hits the last day of the year, you just kind of get uh, just prophetic on your outlook. You're, you know, you're standing on 
uh, the horizon there, looking over to see what the next year is going to be about. And so he tells us, is it going to be more strife or turmoil or whoa, no, no, no. You'll go into 1980 in turmoil and strife. You'll go into 1980 seemingly with no answers to the problems. But remember, he says, I'm with you. Uh, the thing that you've been seeing in the Middle East is the activity of Satan because he knows what is about to come in the spring of 1980. I don't remember anything particular as far as, you know, the millennium began or something in the spring of 1980. Remain firm and strong. I have not taken a dim view. I have not ceased my power, saith the Lord, for I am the one. I am God, saith God, and it will come to pass that those things which I have spoken in my word and those things which have been said by my prophets shall begin to explode in the spring of 1980. Now, that's been four years ago. And what they mean, these things are prophets prophesied, I'll tell you more about in the next few messages when we read a lot of their articles. I didn't bring all of them tonight. I just brought this one tonight, and I got a lot of them. And you'll see what they're prophesying. But it is all about peace and prosperity and great revival sweeping the world and the power of God falling on Washington and everyone repenting and crying over their sins. That never happened. It never even began to happen. They're prophesying a neo-millennial period, a neo-millennial age before the millennial age begins. And guess what? Charismatics are letting them get away with it. Amen. Why? Charismatics like to hear things like that. Amen. I like to hear them. I like to hear that tomorrow gas is only going to be a nickel a gallon. I mean, I, would, I like to hear that. They like to hear the economy is just going to be great. Everything's going well. Eggs will be down instead of 70 cents a dozen, they'll be down to just three cents a dozen. And charismatics flock to meetings like that. And guess what? Old Testament Israel just flocked to the false prophets and said, isn't that a beautiful song they're singing? Because they're telling us, oh, this, this city is the Lord's city. America's God's country. It'll never go down the drain. That's exactly what the Old Testament Jews were saying just before Babylonian captivity. That's right. That's right. Exactly what they were saying. That's why I said that you have to tie the politics and the peace in together because they're prophesying just like the false prophets in the Old Testament did about their beloved city or their beloved nation. God certainly wouldn't forsake us. After all we've done, we've got his holy temple here. And what do Americans say? We've got a born-again president, and we have on our currency in God we trust. And we allow people to read the Bible. We're not a communist society or fascist society around here. We're a God-fearing, God-loving country. Then why are all the topless bars and movie houses open on every corner if there's not a denominational church there there's one of those things there then and guess what these false prophets aren't prophesying close all that down they're telling us god's going to bless us in spite of all that because you know why they're not because they know that'll never happen they're realistic to realize that that's never going to happen you're never going to get all the movie houses and the bars and so forth to close down uh the betting tracks to close down you'll never get that to happen the state lottery to close up in the states, you'll never get that to happen. So they're going to tell us that God's going to bless us in spite of that. Now, our friend Jeremiah had the same problem in his day that we have in our day. Amen. So let's go over to his book and take his advice. I believe that would be scriptural to do. Amen. Jeremiah had exactly the same problem that we have today. Not some, not a few, not half, but many, if not all except himself, of the religious leaders of his day, he prophesies against them in chapter 23 in Ezekiel and in his chapter in chapter 34. All of the religious leaders are telling the people deception by telling them all the good that's going to come upon them. And you just saw this article. I didn't read all of it. I just read the first couple of paragraphs. What shall we expect in 1980? And they're saying the same thing about 84. They'll say the same thing about 85. And sooner or later, they're going to get lucky, they think, and hit the right year when the millennium finally starts. But they're missing it all the time, though. 
And you want me to tell you what got all this started? I'll tell you what got all it started. This country's bicentennial celebration. If you were in the charismatic movement back when I was, it had to be back in 76, that is exactly what got all of this started. All of a sudden, these romantic, nostalgic ideas of Americanism and Mama and Chevrolets and apple pie came up before people's eyes and they became so thankful for this great godly country that was founded on godly principles, which if you know anything at all about American history was not founded on godly principles. Some of the very founders were in spiritualism and they were Unitarians in their church beliefs and they were not Christians. They did not believe the word of God. Amen. And you can start from the very beginning and come all the way to the present we have today. Amen. And there hasn't been one of them who's been a Christian. Now, before you can refute that, you've got to know what the, the biblical definition of a Christian is. Amen. And we around here know what that is. Amen. It's not one who talks about God and talks about four score and seven years ago, this country was founded on Christian principles. He's one who does the will of God. Amen. Amen. Matthew 7, verses 21 and 22. There's going to be a lot that prophesy in my name, that cast out demons in my name, that do many wonderful works in my name. But Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 21 to 22, I'll tell them I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Yeah, during old Abe Lincoln's time, they had to hop up on the piano to hold it down from floating around in their seance services there. Now, you're not going to read that in some political religious rights journal because they're going to tell you about all the positive religious things that we've seen in our founding fathers, or Lincoln's not a founding father, but some of the great American presidents or congressmen or whatever that we've had in the past. They're not going to tell you how they dabble in the occult, and it doesn't take much study to find that through and through. Well, anyway, over to Jeremiah, I think chapter 8, We'll find out what Jeremiah's response was to the whole situation. And it is remarkable that we're seeing the same thing today. Amen. Now, we're not going to get off in talking about the moral majority and all of the non-charismatic elements of this strong religious right that has arisen. We're going to stay with the charismatic aspect of it because that's where we direct most of our teaching. It ought to be obvious that if one of the groups is wrong, then both of the groups are wrong about this whole thing concerning peace and politics. And you have to listen to some of the non-charismatic ones, and they're for God and country. You know, it's, it's God and country all the way. And that is Old Testament Israel mentality, and that was allowed by Old Testament Israel as long as they were walking in the will of God. God said, you're going to be a peculiar nation unto me, and there is no nation outside you that is peculiar to me. In other words, God dealt with his people on a national basis. Now, he doesn't do that today. You show me the verse in the New Testament. He does not do that today. You show me the verse in the book of Acts. He does not do that today. That was peculiar to Old Testament Israel where he dealt with the whole nation of people, where it was his will, according to Deuteronomy 17, that a godly king was set up over them that they had godly religious rulers, their priests and Levites and high priests, as well as godly uh, political leaders like their king and his advisors and the judges of the land. And that simply is not true for America today. It's not true for Israel today. It's not true for anyone today. To enter the kingdom, you can't join a nation. You have to be born anew, as Jesus says in John chapter 3. So Jeremiah 8 in verse 10. Therefore will I give their wives unto others and their fields to them that shall inherit them. For every one from the least even unto the greatest is given to covetousness from the prophet even unto the priest. Everyone dealeth falsely. The religious leaders of their day, the prophet and the priest. For they have healed now watch what he says in verse 11. For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly. All you're treating is the symptoms. It's just a slight healing. How did they do that? By saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. 
Now, he says this earlier back in chapter 6 with a few more verses. Chapter 6 and verse 13. So Jeremiah is laboring the point. He preaches the same message twice. That's why we're going to deal with it in more than one message. Because there's a lot we can say about the political aspect. There's a lot we can say about their anti-doom and gloom stance that most of them are claiming, as well as confusions about things such as Second Chronicles 7.14. And you have to remember, it's Old Testament, and it's talking about Israel as well. Uh, groups like Intercessors for America, which was founded, I think, back in 74. And if you do a little history study into the foundation of that group, which I was a part of it way back then, I'm not now, but I know why it was founded. And the reason it was founded was because of the upcoming bicentennial of this country. People got all excited about Americanism and God, as though patriotism and spirituality are to be equated with one another. And people just, you know, the newsletters that came out, I still got some of them. I'm going to bring some of them and show them to you. Stars and stripes on them in 76. Because, you know, we're for the president and traditional values and the moral majority and Betsy Ross. You know, they, they have their pick of, of what they're for. It has something to do with patriotism. And it's the same thing that's true with Old Testament Israel when God had given them plenty of opportunities to repent and they chose not to. And this nation, as a nation, has had plenty of opportunities to repent, Amen. and it still has not repented, and it never will repent. Amen. A person is foolish to think this nation is ever going to Amen. repent. Amen. You know, a person is so shallow and in so much darkness, you would wonder whether they've ever read the New Testament or the Old. We just saw it in Psalm 9 and verse 17 that all the nations that forget God are going to be turned into hell. And all of them have already forgotten God. And they're going to be turned to that very place. It was true in the Old Testament, and it's going to be true today. But here in chapter 6 and verse 13, For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness, and from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. Same as what we've just read in chapter 8. They have healed also the hurt, of the daughter of my people slightly. This is not the way to go about bringing change. Saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Now, you're at a little disadvantage if you haven't kept up with these charismatic ministries since I am not going to do a lot of reading from their articles tonight. But you can come back for the next few services on Friday night and you'll hear what they have to say. And that's exactly what they're saying. Peace, peace. And if you've been up with it, you know it's all the time in their prophecies. Thus saith the Lord, a great wave of my glory is now descending on the earth. And there shall be many healings and many people saved. And, and all nations shall come unto me and my power shall flow. And just on and on and on about peace, prosperity, the positive aspect of life, God and country, peace, prosperity, God and country, they kind of go around in circles. Yeah. New inventions going to come, they tell us. I've got several prophecies from one religious goofball telling us about uh, many inventions that are going to come so we can put satellites in outer space and beam the gospel from there. Now, where's your chapter and verse for beaming the gospel from outer space? He said, you go into all the nations Amen. and preach. He didn't say, beam your smiling face there. And don't say, well, God didn't know about satellites. He's known about everything from the beginning to the end. I mean, revelation is yet to be fulfilled. And he's prophesied a lot that's going to happen in revelation. By the way, what's revelation the whole book about? Judgment. Amen. Yeah. And if you had a charismatic John the Apostle around today on the Isle of Patmos, he wouldn't be there. They never would have locked him up because he would have petitioned to get off the island if they would have ever locked him up. He would have written 22 chapters of revelation of his revelation of the neo-millennial age, the millennium before the millennium, 50-year head start on God. They wanted to start now. 
And some of them wish that it started a long time ago. And they've been telling us it's going to start every year and seem to miss all of Revelation. By the way, it's the same group of people who are telling us that the denominational system, as well as the charismatic denominational system, which is Great Babylon in the book of Revelation, is not going to go through the tribulation period. Now, before we finish reading Jeremiah 6, take a little bit of Revelation 3. Hallelujah. Revelation 3 and verse 10. Now, here's what Revelation said. I know what charismatics and non-charismatics are telling us, that Jesus is going to come back and going to catch the church up. And he's not going to catch that old doubting, skeptical church up for anything. Amen. He's going to leave them right here. And those that are truly born again, they'll make it after three and a half years. And they're going to be purged for their unbelief during that three and a half year period. Amen. My Bible says he's coming back, Ephesians 5, for a spotless without blemish bride. Amen. Amen. And they can't even trust him for a simple headache without running to the doctor, 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 I'm about to die, what's wrong with me? That's right. Amen. Supporting medical schools, supporting insurance companies, supporting just about everything that the Word of God doesn't support. That's right. And you think God's going to take them up? There's no way. What about all those that, and they're not many, and he tells us how many in the book of Revelation, what about all those who are diligently preparing themselves now by trusting God for all things? Are they going to be just caught up with those that got by without trusting him for anything? Certainly not. He said that he's left things with us and that he's going to hold us responsible when he comes back. And what happened to that one little soul that had one little talent? He left him with a talent, must have been a disciple of his. He didn't leave talents with unsaved people. Went and buried it didn't do anything, didn't trust God for everything. And what did he do to that servant? He said, you're going to have your portion with the unbelievers. Ended up not even being saved then. Revelation 3.10, because thou hast kept the word of my endurance. Now, what if some aren't enduring further through their trials? Because, Revelation 3.10, because thou hast kept the word of my endurance, I also will keep thee from the hour of trial, not temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now, do you know what I've heard charismatic leaders say? They say, oh, no, God would never use the tribulation period to purge Christians because he purges us by his word. That's right. He's supposed to be purging us by his word, but people aren't listening to the word today. And if they're not going to listen to the word, he just told us here, if you don't keep the word of my endurance, then there's going to come this hour of trial upon all the earth, and it's going to try you. It's going to try Christian and non-Christian alike to find out whether or not they really are Christian. Now, I'm not saying we're going to be here. He just says, because... You have kept the word of my endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial. So those that are going to be kept from the hour of trial are going to be those who have kept the word of his endurance. And how can you keep it when most charismatics don't even know the word of God? I mean, as soon as you mention something about divine healing, they want to tell us about Job's boils, Paul's thorn, Epaphroditus' sickness, And Timothy drank some wine, and Luke was a doctor. And they skipped right over Isaiah 53, where it says that Jesus bore our pains and sicknesses. Now, how about that? You never hear that from them. You never hear that. Y'all, you'll hear those other proof texts, but you won't hear 1 Peter 2.24. And those that are saying 1 Peter 2.24, as soon as it's serious, they're down to the emergency room faster than you could get there if you were going. And we don't go there because there aren't any emergencies. There aren't any emergencies. 
Trials, yes. Emergencies, no. Jesus never had an emergency. <laughs> Trials and persecution, yes. That's to be expected. That's what we're talking about. That is to be expected in this life. Amen. Not peace and prosperity. Paul, in emergency, he died over in Acts 14. That's no emergency. <laughs> and if you don't believe he was dead, read 2 Corinthians 11. He said that he was dead. And even if he wasn't dead, I read one commentator who was bright and should say this. He says some people try to argue Paul was dead or wasn't dead. Even if he wasn't dead, he was beat to a pulp, and he got up and walked the same day. So you got a miracle either way you go. <laughs> so whether you want to make him dead or not dead, you got a miracle either way. Now, he happened to believe that he wasn't dead, but at least he still believed in a miracle. He said they stoned him and beat him, and the disciples stood around and thought he was dead. So let's assume that he wasn't dead. It said that he got up, and they went off and took a long journey the very next day. Further continue.